Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organization issues and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about early childhood development with the management team of Oakland's St. Vincent's Day Home, Alexandra Hilario, Executive Director, Robin Bertelson, President of the Board, and David Rodriguez, the Program Director of St. Vincent's Day Home. Thank you so much for being here. This is such an important topic, right? We are talking about the future of families. We're talking about the future of individuals. We're talking about the future of the country when we're talking about early childhood education. I'm so honored that you were able to make time for me today. Thank you, Mark. It's glad to be here. So let's let's go directly to you, Alexandra, as St. Vincent's staff leader. Let's get, get your take on the, the issue of how children come into the world the thing that I always um, focus on is that it depends on what zip code you're born into, what the wealth of the family that you're born into, the circumstance that you're born, born into. That basically sets your path in this world. And really, as a country, we should be taking care of our children. Every child should have every opportunity and that is not how we function today. And you're trying to heal that issue. Talk a little bit about how you see children functioning in this world and how we can help all adults. All adults in this country can actually help to resolve it by taking certain concerted action. Yes, uh, thank you. That is very accurate. Um, it, a lot of times this it good determines the future of, of our children and our families. And St. Vincent's Day Home has been in the same location for 113 years. And our focus has been from the very beginning is to serve the most vulnerable children and families. Those without a home, those with challenging socioeconomic circumstances, those that are facing, have faced trauma and other significant challenges in life. And the goal is to serve them with dignity and to educate the families as well as not just the children to help them move forward in life, to give the parents the tools to continue to educate their children once they leave St. Vincent's Day Home. Our core value has always been driven by uh, the work that, that we recognize that children come to us and they often face very overwhelming circumstances, obviously beyond their control. And our role is to create that environment that we are an oasis in the middle of uh, the urban environment here in Oakland, and they can thrive despite their barriers and the circumstances that they're born into. So we use a holistic approach with our programs, with our food program, uh, our family services, our education and our leadership. We all work together to offer them stability, healing and hope. The thing that really strikes me is that an organization that was founded, uh, what was it, in 1911? Yes. Look at the environment that we had in 1911. It was the sailing ship days. It was manufacturing, but on a very small scale, not industrial manufacturing. That was just taking hold. It was before any electronic communication. It was when we had different uh, and somewhat isolated communities that were trying to collaborate on an economic basis and one person who might come from a background of wealth is looking at their neighbor and is saying, those children, that neighbor's child does not have my advantages, I'm going to help. Talk a little bit about how you as a board member, Robin, identify with board members, founders of that era of 113 years ago and how you see it as, as a board member functioning today in this totally different environment, but you are connected by a thread of commitment and heart back through those ages. Exactly. The, the thing that strikes me actually about the Day Homes founding is that when the Sisters of the Holy Family opened up their actual home to serve the neighborhood's children because they realized that the families in the area were leaving their kids a home alone because a lot of times both parents, even you know, we think of both parents working as a modern-ish issue, but in 1911, it was the same challenge. So 
they opened up the home and gave these children love and education and the opportunity right from the start. And that has never changed for us. Like that core element is been there the entire 113 years and, and for 113 more. The, um, you know, we've been through two pandemics, world wars. Uh, you know, it, it's crazy the things that the day home has seen. And at the, the, so we had, we were, um, let me start that again. So the things that the day home has seen has changed over the years. We've gone through so many different socioeconomic crises. Yeah, just think back to some of the challenges, the different challenges from the 80s okay. to today, even um, you know, in the last 50 years or so. The things that bring volunteers such as myself, I've been a volunteer at the day home for 15 years and board president for the last two years, um, is that our unwavering understanding and devotion to making sure that children have these core elements to bring them up, that they have loving, smart teachers who care about them every day, that they come into an environment that is warm and inviting. And um, that, the, the beautiful thing is that doesn't change over the years. We still need to do this on a daily basis. Uh, so as a board member and as a volunteer, I get to just keep doing that. And I have amazing uh, executive director and staff that have to do the hard work of staying up with the modern education principles, making sure that we're doing the right thing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but it is uh, you know, something that is, and, and enriches David, our lives. Mm -hmm. taking, taking Robin's point, you know, there are so many aspects of this that abide right? The fact of two parents working and needing to work, uh, that has been around forever, right? Particularly at the lower income, it's an all-in issue. Children themselves must become educated before they enter into the workforce. So there needs to be a foundational time where if a, if a parent can't um, afford to stay home, uh, somebody needs to take care of that child, but also uh, bring that child through the early learning stages, the issues of language, right? The languages have changed over the years, but the issue of language and cultural appropriate, culturally appropriate uh, interactions, talk a little bit about how you think about those issues when you're providing your programs and when you're shaping your staff and you're shaping the content uh, that the children and families experience? Well, um, you know, it's easy to forget that sort of learning science and developmental science are very new fields. If you think about sort of democracy or political science and that thousand year history, psychology, developmental science, these are these these fields are at their nascent. So so we're at an incredible time of just so much research coming through about how to support families who've been through trauma, how to support families that speak different languages, how to support families at different developmental stages, and also just understanding those stages. But I also think in a simpler way, it sort of just goes back to being the home away from home for every child. You know, that's an ethical stake in the ground. And a lot of things that are, you know, a scientifically developmentally sound education can be very tightly linked to just trying to be a child's home away from home, trying to attend to their child with the same love and care that their parents do. You spoke earlier about the idea of St. Vincent's as an oasis, because it is true that children are up against institutional barriers that they shouldn't be that have a real impact on their future outcomes. However, I prefer to think of it as we're an oasis in a community full of oases. Every child's living room is an oasis. And we're a bridge between these two oases, the school and, and the home, and partnering with parents to learn about their child. Because any application of modern developmental science, the first thing you do is you need to understand that child deeply. To do that, you have to connect to the home oasis and be that bridge so that then you can end, act from that basis. I love the points that you're making, this, this whole idea of we have these developmental science 
uh, sciences that are relatively new, but we have an, an abiding need for just empathy, the home, these these values that every family from time immemorial have has tried to promulgate. You've got the science on the one hand, and you've got the empathetic caretaking element on the other. They're not at odds, right? They're, 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 they interact. And then I also love this idea of helping parents navigate because, you know, when my kids were born, an instruction book didn't pop out. You know, with, I mean, basically, I had to learn every day. And are you functioning, Alexandra, a little bit as a support group for parents who might um, have difficulties of their own to navigate as a education group, as a as a lesson sharing uh, community as well? Absolutely. I mean, St. Vincent's Day Home has been a pillar in Oakland for over a century, and the population have changed, the demographics have changed, but our mission hasn't changed. We've been working with families, and we've evolved with the region's challenging um, challenges and the needs of the demographic needs. And that means that we are committed to uh, providing parent workshops, parent education, partnering with parents in the education of their children, helping them understand um, how to uh, work with this children, their children, how to instill discipline in, in their children, not as something that we do to them, but something that we help develop within them. And um, we address, uh, try to uh, provide them support and connections when they have issues with housing insecurity, immigration challenges, and other systemic inequities, because we understand that before any child can learn and grow, their foundational needs must be met, and that includes their families. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the home away from home. Um, our previous executive director, Corinne Mormon, who was the executive director for 40 years, uh, she says, she always says, as long as there's a St. Vincent's, there will always be a place for a child to call home. So we emphasize on their safety, nutrition, healthcare. We ensure that children have um, a nurturing space that we have assess their health. We have volunteer nurses that come in and, and assess our children. We also have freshly cooked meals in our kitchen by our kitchen staff, and they do it very lovingly. Uh, and it, we, we, uh, have volunteers that come at our school. We have a volunteer librarian. We make sure that we have field trips to provide those experiences that they don't have. And when we have our field trips, there we take children to places that the families probably couldn't afford. And we have so many parents that want to be part of that, that in many uh, field trips, we almost have a one-to-one -one ratio of adult to children. So we include the parents in everything that we do. So let's talk a little bit about how this organization is sustained, because you are sustained by a combination of different uh, funding streams. There are There is funding streams that come from government programs. In other words, government collects taxes and then, and then funds certain programs that benefit uh, Oakland in this particular case, but also around the country. And then you have contributions, you have volunteer, you have in-kind. Could, could one of you, or maybe we should just sort of dogpile this, how do we ensure that St. Vincent's remains financially strong in service to this mission? We have um, support from many well-known organizations. We have support from the Warriors Foundation. We receive support from First Five California. Um, we Most of our funding comes from the state. Um, and But we a lot of what we are able to do in addition to the ba meeting the basic needs and the basic requirements of the state, going above and beyond with everything that we provide to our children, it is thanks to the individual supporters that we have. We have uh, individual supporters that send us a check every single month. Uh, just It's just something that they do that comes out of their account automatically, and they've done that for decades. We have other supporters who send a check once a month, others once a year. We have uh, funders who have passed on and have left their the foundations that continue to provide support for us through decades. So that is where, where the majority of our support comes from. But besides the state, is from those individual donors who are committed to supporting St. Vincent's Day Home on an ongoing basis. Robin, you want to jump in? Yeah, a little bit. Um, the I think one of the benefits of being in California and our current administration is the Newsom sees the value in early childhood education. So we have been beneficiaries of a growing 
allocations. I think that might be the right word, Alexander, right? For the primary programs that we um, contract with the state to fulfill. And those um, contracts are uh, the foundational element, as Alexandra said, for us. And then these extra fund monies that come from grants that we apply for, we have several um, Bay Area-based foundations who are very generous and close to the day home that also step in with large uh, gifts, fortunately. And then we have an amazing base that we've built over the years of individuals who, as Alexander uh, explained, donate regularly in whatever interval that they uh, they find. We also have a few fundraising events because what nonprofit wouldn't have that? Um, and and it all comes together to provide the day home with amazing financial stability. That we've worked on this really hard as a board to create that financial stability for decades. So it's been very important as a board member, especially as board president, that should the state funding for some reason decline, that our level of service will not decline. We will have the money to pay our staff to provide the amazing extra um, needs to fulfill the extra things that our families need. So that's been part of our success. That's an amazing point, right? Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is pursuing a strategy of diversified funding streams Mm-hmm. so that you are resilient. And I could be talking with someone in Iowa providing this service. Mm-hmm. I could be talking to somebody in Texas. I could be so- talking to somebody in New York or in Maine or in Minnesota. Those kinds of strategies and the all-in nature of this is so important for resilience. I'd like to um, to talk a little bit about staffing because one of the things that that I've come to be really aware of is that the people who are able and competent to provide the programmatic support, that's a special skill set. It's also a skill set that is not well compensated. Um, it is a skill set that is not necessarily as respected as it should be, right? And uh, David, when you're recruiting people, you're bringing people into your environment with them being aware of those facts, yet they bet their career on this path anyway. Talk a little bit about the motivation that you and your colleagues have that caused them to focus on this type of service to the community as opposed to uh, trying to conform in a way that will bring them more money, more prestige, you know, you, you, you actually have people who make this choice, not because they have to, but because that's who they are. You know, I've actually worked, I think, in every level of education in my career, including community college, including overseas, in other countries, school systems. And um, the early childhood educator really, in general, really stands out as people who just feel spiritually connected to this work. They have every reason to be just as frustrated as high school teachers or elementary school teachers, but, but they, they just seem to be so closely connected to the mission of serving children. And it just seems to be so clear to them that that is what their vocation is, that there is just a level of serene sanity that they bring to their work. Um, that just, it just, as someone who's worked in every level of education, I am just blown away, um, by the staff at St. Vincent's, um, and by how much they sort of leave their frustrations at the door, whatever they may be. And they just are so present with the children each day. It's really incredible. Um, because yes, they are underpaid, but every school community I've ever worked for at every age level, the teachers are, are, are underpaid relative to the value they bring society, um, this staff, they don't any any um, if they have frustrations with that, they don't bring it into work. In addition to that, um, since Alexandra has taken um, the executive director position, staff salaries have been raised considerably. Um, I don't want to casually throw out a percentage, but and, and be wrong, but it, it's quite significant. There are both annual raises were given in addition to cost of living increases, um, and we really are aiming to be the highest paying childcare center 
in the area, um, at, or at least on par with the other highest paying childcare centers. And, and we monitor that closely to honor that commitment that we have to our staff that they feel honored that they don't feel like they are compromising anything when they come to work for the day home. And if, if I may add to that, I, I want to say that the board has been really um, diligent and appreciative of our staff. And the way that, that they've done that is that when I've gone to them and say, we need to pay our staff more, the, this position is becoming more competitive after the pandemic, a lot of educators left the field because they are underappreciated and underpaid. But when I went to the board and said, we need to increase um, our salaries, they didn't just use the budget that the state has provided, though the state is providing a higher um, uh, uh, reimbursement because they understand the value. But the board has those funds that they have invested really well for decades. They've used some of those funds to provide those increases. We also take really good care of our staff when it comes to health care. We provide uh, medical, dental, and vision for our staff. And we also uh, have a 401k plan that we match up to 5%. And um, our staff, uh, the longer they've been here, the, the more obviously that they accrue in sick time and vacation time. And we have many staff that have been here for 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, and, and so on. And one thing that is unique about St. Vincent's Day Home and that the staff and I are really passionate, that the, the board and I are really passionate about is that our sick days never expire. So we have staff who have been with us for decades, who are loyal, who have been fairly healthy, and they have 1,400, 1,500 hours of, of sick time available to them. And we will never take that away from them because they're not rich. They're not here for the money. But we want them to know that if they were to, they or a family member were to fall on hard times and were sick and they needed to take care time for themselves or for a family member, they don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from or how they will pay their rent. So that is, there's some of the ways that we really try to take care of our staff, not just providing them uh, professional development and support and being there for them, but making sure that it is in a significant way that they feel safe when they're here. <laughs> That's so important. What you're saying is that you're not trying to extract work from people in a transactional basis. You're trying to cultivate people. You're trying to cultivate children. You're trying to cultivate families. You're trying to cultivate a team, retain the team. You're trying to respect the team. These are all family values. And in a pure dollars and cents way of thinking, what you're suggesting, what you are doing, might not extract the most from an individual or individuals to an organization, but it strengthens an entire community by not extracting, but by cultivating. You're cultivating the organization, you're cultivating your families, aren't you? And you include in your families, not only the, the children, but the staff, right? Exactly, Mark. You include in yeah. your family, right, Robin, the board. Yeah. It's, it's one family of people who are trying to, some people will have information on early childhood development techniques, David. Some people will not have that, but will have compassion to give or volunteer time. Some people will bring a child in and somebody else will educate that child. A board member might have means and provide some, some, um, some finances uh, mm -hmm. for this. A, a partner in the community might, might help. You're basically cultivating how the United States ought to work, right? That is, that is uh, dead on. You know, as we think about lifting our, the children and the families that we primarily serve, the um, the staff, because we've recognized for many years that the underappreciated nature of the work that they do, where we include them as a board member, we include them on how do we help these people advance their careers, improve their family situation, and grow to be better citizens and human beings. Um, and we've reaped the benefits of that, as Alexander said, with the staff tenure that you just don't see in a typical child development family service center. So as, as we come to the end of our time here, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you each see going into the future, because look, Running an organization like this, Alexandra, is not all peaches and cream, right? There are some challenges. So let's talk a little bit about what you want to accomplish next and some of the challenges that you see that stand between that and, and uh, you know, your objectives and, and, uh, and your future. 
Absolutely. There, there are many challenges and I do have a sticker on my computer that says, remember why you started, because on those tough days, we have to remember the reasons why we went in, into this, to do this work, into this field. And uh, like, I, I, like David, I've, I've taught every grade from uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. I've been a principal for also every grade from TK through eighth, th- through 12th grade. I was, from, uh, was the principal for a high school and my commitment has always been to serve children and to serve families. And there are, this is a unique time. I think Robin uh, mentioned this briefly that the people are recognizing, and especially in the state of California, the value of the zero to five education. So we are receiving more support and more funding. In, and with that, it also comes more requirements. We have children post pandemic who are really delayed in their learning, in their social skills, um, a lot more, um, Children are being diagnosed with different learning challenges, and that means that we need to provide additional support. So with that additional uh, funding that we are receiving, we are uh, providing um, additional speech services, um, social emotional support. We have um, speech therapists, um, also uh, occupational therapists. Um, therapists that come here and we pay for all those, um, even for children that are not diagnosed with needs. But at the moment that we see that a child has additional challenges to identify, we start, start to provide that support immediately because we know that early intervention is key. So all those, um, the challenge of supporting a higher percentage of children with special needs is, is challenging. Also, we have, um, the, the inflation is is a challenge because our staff, we want them to have a dignified life. So we have found ourselves looking at the market and trying to do the best we can. Both David and um, Robin mentioned to give them the best, the most races that we can, to give them the most support that we can. But, um, and also it, staffing has been challenging. We, we're we're lucky in the, in the fact that we have loyalty and we haven't had such a challenge um, hiring because of how we treat our staff. But it is a challenge to get higher quality staff. We don't just want to hire someone that wants to collect a paycheck. It's not even that big of a paycheck. We want somebody that's committed and passionate about serving this community. So all those are challenges, serving children with special needs, ensuring that families are supported, ensuring that our staff is paid uh, accordingly to the needs and in this very expensive area, those are the challenges that we're facing going forward. David, you want to add anything? Robin, you want to add anything in terms of uh, particular challenges that you see coming into the future? Um, I guess, uh, I guess, in terms of challenges, um, there are all the challenges that Alexandra mentioned, um, but I also sort of view them as opportunities because. Um, you know, I heard once from somebody that stayed Vincent's, uh, like it was a, um, some sort of auditor, someone from a nonprofit that kind of comes to St. Vincent's every once in a while. And they said that St. Vincent's has a reputation for uh, never expelling children. And I was so proud to be associated with that because, you know, there are new management guidelines coming from the state of California that are kind of pointing out the sort of... Uh, unfair practices that happen at many child care centers where children are suspended or expelled for 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 reasons that are not developmentally appropriate. And to know that St. Vincent's has long had this reputation to really, um, you know, not resorting to to those steps. It's like we were ahead of the curve. And so I'm just sort of picking up where where the previous leadership left off because you know, many of the challenges that many child care centers are just coming around to embracing, acknowledging St. Vincent's has been meeting head on for years and, and, and while maintaining a lot of staff retention. So, yes, all those challenges that Alexander mentioned are very real, but I feel so much uh, confidence because of just this found foundation that we have. Um, I, I just want to speak to one thing that was spoken to earlier. We talked about the financial stability of the organization I just want to be clear just how extraordinary that is. Again, I'll tout, I have worked for private schools. I've worked overseas. I've worked for large school districts. In every place I have ever worked, I worked for an ed tech startup. For every place I've ever worked, financial instability was palpable at the classroom level. The, the, the feeling of just insecurity was always palpable and it would be apparent in kind of last minute reactive changes to policies or reactive changes to staffing models. We are totally sheltered from that at the day home. It's really extraordinary. And we are just left at the ground level staff to focus on what's right for the children. 
And I'm very aware of how extraordinary and rare that is. And that's why I feel so confident that we will meet those challenges that were mentioned. That's that's superb. Robin, how are how is board recruiting going? It is. There are so many amazing causes and nonprofits out there in the world that there's it, it's a challenge to get new people. Just like our teachers have a long retention, our board members, uh, many of them have decades of service to the day home as well. At 15 years, I'm actually kind of mid. Uh, there's a few with me, less than me, but there's a bunch with a lot more tenure than I have. So that uh, is really great. But we we do look regularly at what are the skills that we would like to bring into the board. And if there's anybody out there interested in serving with us, please call me, please contact me, because we always need more. Um, the, it, it's always a challenge. I find with almost any board, particularly in Oakland, our uh, you don't have to be an Oaklander. I grew up in San Francisco and live in the East Bay, but um, the, it's uh, finding people is always a challenge. Just like when we have a teacher vacancy a bit, finding the exactly the right fit um, is not as easy as I'd like to be. It's amazingly complex because you mm -hmm. also need people who with balanced competencies, balanced mm -hmm. perspectives, representation yeah. of the community is really important fundraising Very. is important robin mm -hmm. thank you so much for for uh rounding out the discussion with this uh pitch for your board recruitment efforts <laughs> um robin bertelson president of the board of the st vincent's day yeah. home alexander hilario executive director and david rodriguez the program director of the st vincent's day home thank you so much for your work and please thank your donors, your staff, your wonderful staff, the the mothers and fathers, the the parents who are uh, who are helping their children to navigate, your children, your teachers, all of the various contributors in different ways to who you are, and and this hundred and thirteen year plus and ongoing journey of Saint Vincent's Day Home. It's it's wonderful to to have you on. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Mark.